to Tokyo Ghoul. My apologies for the delay, but life happens and I'm reading and watching quite a few things at the moment and that just put things back. You know, but that is how things go. We are here now. My apologies, but since my last Tokyo Ghoul update, I have made a rather massive jump, actually. I've read everything prior to the Algiri arc, which I have heard is one of those big game-changing arcs where things really begin to pick up. So I am very excited to read that one, but for now we will be focusing on just two arcs today, the Dove's Emergence arc and the Gourmet arc, the former of which I will confess to enjoying more than the latter, though both are rather enjoyable in their own right. So uh, let's begin with Dove's Emergence. Now this arc essentially captures, I guess, what I was expecting of Tokyo Ghoul. We've got the ghouls, we've got the humans. Our initial assumptions of what ghouls are are going to be subverted by our exposure to them, and that is going to be furthered by painting humans in a negative light to a certain extent. The ultimate purpose, demonizing neither party and placing them essentially on a level playing field. And that's really what this arc did. Where the earliest chapters established Tokyo Ghoul as a horror work, I think that this one sort of captured the thematic heart of things. But long story short, Kaneki is making more of a home for himself at Enteku. The ghouls there, Yoshimura, Yomo, Toka, although she's still a bit abrasive toward him, are trying to make his transition into this new life a little bit easier on him. The Enteku ghouls primarily do not hunt humans down, after all, at least actively relying primarily instead on suicide victims as much as possible. This isn't always exclusively so, and there certainly still is a degree of hesitancy in Kaneki, but there's a real difference in these sort of ghouls as opposed to the ghouls that we had been exposed to prior to this point. The very effort on their part to not harm humans naturally changes Kaneki's perception of things, both of them and basically of what sort of life that he has a chance to live. Now, as part ghoul, part human. This point is further developed by the simple fact that two major characters in this arc are a mother and daughter depending upon Enteku for their food after their husband slash father were killed. Our attention is drawn to two innocents, really, two innocents ultimately targeted by humans, the ghoul investigators, on a simple basis that they are ghouls, though they have technically not really committed crimes, or at least that we know of. Our natural reaction as an audience, I would say, or at least mine, was no, 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 don't do that. To kill a mother before her child daughter's eyes and then go on later to target that child herself, there is something morally off about that. Like, as Kaneki says, if I were actually in this world, the, the idea of the existence of ghoul investigators would seem fitting to me. When ghouls like Rize and then later uh, Tsukiyama and his ilk exist, there is a real danger that needs to be confronted. But then there's that. And it's remarkably unpleasant. But basically, we get two different ghoul investigators here. Aman Kotaro and uh, Maro Kureo. Aman is dedicated to his cause and a sense of justice, and might actually be my favorite character at the moment, although one of them at least. I still do like a... Kaneki and Hide a lot as well. But simply put, I am incredibly intrigued by where his character might go in the future. His last conversation with Kaneki was particularly interesting, and I think that there might be an extent to which he might end up being like the heart of the human side of the story for a little while now, possibly teetering in his beliefs in a way similar to Kaneki. I am looking forward to how the two of them in particular are going to play off of each other in the future. But never mind that. For now, Aman and Mato, they really stand in contrast with each other in spite of the fact that they essentially have the same goal, the same ambitions. Mato is, I would say in a word, fanatical. Fanatical to the point of bordering on monstrous, really. He is the primary, whoa, humans can be kind of awful as well, force in this arc, slaughtering ghouls left and right, regardless of whether he can prove them guilty of anything, hunting them down just so he can collect their kagune and turn them into his kuinque, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. A rather interesting concept, of course, that I'm sure will be played with more in the future, but I can't say much about it now other than that. It's pretty cool. It's an interesting concept. But, and just in general, being incredibly bloodthirsty. I can't say that I liked him at all, but I do think that that was the point. Because... Let's talk about my favorite mo moment in all of Tokyo Ghoul thus far. It's toward the end of chapter 28. 
Amon has had his chat with Kaneki and is going back and looking for Mato, his, his comrade in arms, essentially. However, following uh, Mato's fight with Toka and Minami, Mato is on the verge of death. And I remember thinking during that fight, I think you might just need to kill him, Toka. Something that I generally try to not want to think when I'm reading something. But, of course, then that happens. Then we actually get to see what it looks like when Amon goes to find his body. And it's not pretty. Not at all. Even though for a second I had wished for it. But for it to be given to me, that was not a pleasant time at all. And so I think the real thing that Ishida has done incredibly well thus far is showcasing the horror that each side, per se, is forced to suffer thanks to what is going on. It's a rather effective use of pathos in an attempt to get his point across, and I honestly applaud him for it. Those couple of panels, that, those like two or three pages, those last couple of panels in the chapter, they were, they were really something. Um, and actually, we get this point compounded again in the next arc, but in a different way, through um, Nishiki's story with his sister and then his girlfriend. And it's sort of the inverse. Again, we have Kaneki standing in the middle of things, because that's essentially the, that seems to me to be the point of his character. At this point, it's just like, oh, we've got the ghouls, we've got the humans, and we've got Kaneki in the middle, obviously. But instead of Amon, who hated ghouls, getting a little bit of unexpected insight into that world, we have Nishiki, who hated humans, with re with reason, and he ended up being loved and saved and cared for by a human, his girlfriend. And of course, then, we can further the analogy a little bit more, we've got the fanatical human in Mato and the fanatical ghoul in Tsukiyama. The two arcs sort of play off of each other in a little, rather interestingly in that respect, I think. I can't really develop that idea any more than just saying that that's, I see the a little bit of a mirror image in the two of them. But I think it's interesting. Because yet, at the end of all of this, I am really left wanting more to dig into, per se, because I feel like I can't really say that much more. What have we learned? Humans and ghouls, they need to learn to respect each other and coexist because they're both essentially human on an emotional and a mental level, in spite of one's initial impressions and assumptions about the opposite party, and so it is undoubtedly wrong to allow said, mis uh, said misunderstandings to cause suffering for the other party. This much I get, I think, that that, as a thematic point that Tokyo Ghoul is trying to get across, is very clear. I got it through Dev's Emergence, I got it through Nishiki's story, I got it through uh, Kaneki's just, like, thoughts that run through the chapters. There is, however, I think that there is a lot more to all of this than I can see or discuss at the present moment. I realized that, in particular, as I was going back through the Gourmet arc for the purposes of this review, the early phases especially, and I'm just like, all this stuff with the one-eyed ghoul, with Uta, and with Yomo, even with Tsukiyama himself, there's just a lot going on that's above my head right now. Which is fun to think, it's fun to look forward to all of that. But it leaves me sort of unable to really talk that much more about this. I'm honestly not deep enough into this story to really be able to discuss it well. There's a reason why I haven't discussed, where really honestly I it have not discussed most of the content of the Gourmet arc, it's simply because I don't quite get a lot of it, or at least what it really means for the remainder of the story, aside from the Nishiki subplot. And I feel like there was just so much set up here, so much set up that I can't really... that I don't really know what it's setting up for. Tsukiyama, I can say that he's reasonably intriguing, he's a bit too nutty for my personal taste, so I can't really say that I like him that much, but I think he's got potential. Also, I still don't quite get Toka, like nothing against her, she's pretty cool, but she just hasn't clicked for me yet. Her shock, however, at the end of chapter 46, when Kimi called her beautiful, I think that that is very telling for her character, because like, I, think, I think we can tell that she really isn't happy about the fact that she is a ghoul, although she's rather, I don't want to say defensive of her behavior, but... <clears throat> She's not really tolerant of the way that humans treat ghouls in the slightest. She meets, she deals out to them essentially back what um, they deal out to her. And so, I don't know. 
she'll be interesting to see where she goes from here. I just think that I'm at a weird point where I can sort of get what Ishida is saying, trying to say thematically, but I can't quite follow him yet as far as plot and character go a lot of the time, because we haven't gotten that much of it yet. I can't really say whether this is a good or a bad thing, this ambiguity, as it very well may be intentionally so. But in s to put it simply, things aren't very clear yet for me. More questions I have than answers at this point. On a minor note, I've been listening to the anime soundtrack lately, and it's gorgeous. Like, as I've, as I've been reading the manga, as I was preparing notes for this review, just like listening to it in the background, it's great. Funnily enough, I also watched the uh, first two episodes of the anime, just out of curiosity, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm glad I'm just sticking with the manga. It's not bad, really, but just solidly meh, I guess I could say. It, real uh, articulate on my part, meh. But I think it just, I don't know, cares a little bit too much about the horror gross out factor, and I probably won't be watching any more of it, even just out of curiosity. Um, what else? Just some more technical things, I guess you could say. We can talk about the art for a minute. Ishida's art has a rather unique feel to it. I like it a lot, actually, even though the anatomy can be a tiny bit off at points, but it's also an it's also a manga, so it's really not meant to be the picture of realism anyway. It's very dark, and I don't mean dark as in disturbing, I mean, that that's the case sometimes too, but I mean simply in terms of coloration. He seems to be very dependent upon large areas of pages covered entirely in blacks and grays, and there usually isn't a lot of white space, which I tend to see a lot in other manga, which I don't really mind. But this it does make it stand out a little bit. Naturally, this matches the tone of the series itself, but it also gives off an impression of an incredible attention to detail, which sort of grounds everything that's going around in the world. Um, on a more critical note, the panels are at times a little bit hard to follow, especially during fight scenes. Fat, fast-paced ones, I unfortunately lack the knowledge to describe exactly why that may be the case, but I do believe that um, a little more clarity in terms of just motion, exactly what is happening in fight scenes and fast-paced scenes would be beneficial. But I think that that is really all I have to say about Tokyo Ghoul at this point. I am looking forward to next arc. It's going to be a lot of fun, I think, to see where the rest of the story goes, the characters, all of this uh, ambiguity that I'm currently trying to mull over, you know, all that. But yeah, that's all I have to say. Please leave any thoughts you have down in the comments. I would be happy to hear them. Even if I don't reply to every comment, I can promise you that I do read them all. So yes, thank you very much for watching. Please like or subscribe, and I'll see you soon.